Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَتُدْرَوُنَّ فِي أَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ وَلَتُسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم ومن الذين أشركوا أذى كثيرا. الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the Quran that you will be tested in your wealth and in your persons, in your lives, your property and your persons, your well-being, your safety, and you will hear much harm, things that bother you. أذى أذى is anything that harms you. You believe. You'll hear much harm from the people who were given the book before you, meaning the Jews and the Christians, Ahlul Kitab, and from those who are polytheists, idolaters, or min al ashraku, adan kathira. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells how you respond to that. Wayn tasbiru wa tattaku, inna dharika man azm al umur. So if you show patience, and if you have taqwa, piety, that's the essence of this affair. In dharika, in azm al-umur. That's at the root of what this affair is about. That's how you're tested. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that's, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتُ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That He created life and death, or death and life, in order to try you, the same word, you're going to have tribulation, bala. You're going to have tribulation. He did this in order to try you to see which of you is the most beautiful in action. Ahsan wa amala. The people of ihsan. The people that respond. Itba' bin lati hiya ahsan. Respond in the most beautiful way. Right? Let us do it. Hasanat wa la siya. The, a good deed and a bad deed are not the equal. They're not equal. So respond to a bad deed with a good deed. That's the point. Ijfa' billati hiya ahsan. That when you push back, push back with a good thing, not with a bad thing. Push back with a good thing. And this is reiterated in the hadith when the Prophet said to Mu'ad, he gave him this uh, advice. He said, Kharq al Nasbi' bi khuluq al Hassan. Have beautiful character. Wa atfi' siya al Hassana tamhuha. And follow up any foul deed, whether it comes from you or somebody else, with a good deed. And it would obliterate it. Because the nature of goodness, it obliterates evil. Some theologian argued that evil is actually the absence of goodness. That evil is present because of the vacuum of goodness. So if there's goodness, evil doesn't have any room to exercise itself. So the Prophet was told to be patient. And his people were told to be patient. Now, one of the things, you, you're looking, I'm sure all of you are aware of what's happening uh, around the Muslim world. You see, look at the countries where things are not out of control in the Muslim world. Malaysia is a very educated place. Turkey is a very educated place. You know, they, they're Muslims. If you go to Turkey, they love Islam. The mosques are filled. Right? If you go to uh, Malaysia, they love Islam, their mosques are filled. Go to certain Muslim countries and you'll see that it's very different from other Muslim countries. What is the hallmark of the distinguishing characteristic that makes them different? I will guarantee you, it's not Iman. It's not Iman. It's education. They have higher levels of education. It's as simple as that. The more educated you are, the less likely you are to make a fool out of yourself. Because people who are ignorant people do ignorant things. That's why they're called juhad. The jahad is somebody who does ignorant things. It's called jahadiyya. Now, when you have a lot of ignorant people, but you have regulators for those ignorant people, these are called shiyukh. Like in a tribal society, you have a wise person. That's what shaykh means, wise. That's one of the meanings. It has several meanings in Arabic. One of them is wise. So when there's a problem, the people, the ignorant people, they go to the wise person. And they say, what should we do? And then he says, we should do this or this, settle down, calm down. Now, when the sahaba, you know, 
the Arabs by their nature. Arabs are, are uh, a desert people by their nature. Desert people are hot people. This is well known. They have by their nature a choleric temperament. They're hot people. The Prophet was dealing with them all the time. You can read Sira from beginning to end, and you will see constantly, even amongst his companions, hot-headedness. You will see this. Hot-headedness. Oh, Bob. Ah. Really, this is part of our tradition. But what is the Prophet always doing? Calm down. When they were shouting takbir before a battle, he said, about the Antusikon, have some dignity. You're not calling on a deaf god. He never raised his voice in the marketplace. The ulama say, or he, he rarely did it. He didn't do it as a habit. He, the few times that he was in the marketplace, one time he really did it with some humor, with a man who was trying to sell something, and the prophet put his the hand, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the man's eyes, and he said, Man yashtari had al abd, who's going to buy this slave? And then he said, Ida tijiduni and Allahi kasida. Like, I don't, I'm not, because you have to shout when, when, a, when your goods aren't good, then you have to shout out. When they're good, you don't have to say, sit oh, you That means you don't think I'm something that will sell easily, so you have to advertise. That's what he was essentially saying. He said, that's not in the life because you're not uh, something uh, of little worth with Allah. That was Zahir. He, he said, Zahir and Badir, and I'm The Prophet this was his nature. He was once walking in a Sahih hadith, Aisha relay. He was walking with Aisha, and, and this is in Medina. This is after he has power. Not in Mecca, where, where they were oppressed. No, he's in Medina, and he's with his wife. And a group of Ahl al-Kitab walked by, and one of them, or all of them, said, As-salamu alaykum. Now, this is, uh, this is a, a way of just trying to goat somebody. Because salam means peace, salam means death. But, you know, salam alaykum, salam alaykum, it's almost like you could get away with it. Aisha heard that, and she said, Wa alaykum, wa la'natullah, wa ghadiballahu alaykum. You know, and on you, death, and the uh, damnation of God, go to hell, and may God's wrath be upon you. The Prophet Sallallahu says, Mahlan ya Aisha, slow down. Go easy, ya Aisha. Mahlan ya Aisha. And then Aisha, you know, she's, here's this young woman who loves her husband, and she knows he's the messenger of Allah, and she hears somebody speaking in of him. She gets angry. What does he say? Mahman, slow down, take it easy. And then he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Be gentle. Alayki Rifq. This is not in normal circumstances. This is in a circumstance where you're being provoked. Alayki Rifq. Wa iyaki. Beware of violence and using foul language. Anything that's uncouth. Here's Aisha because she was a strong woman. Didn't you hear what they said? Maybe he didn't hear. Maybe he doesn't understand why I reacted. Maybe he thought they said, Assalamu alaikum. Alam tasma' ma qalu ya Rasulullah. Didn't you hear what I said? In other words, who's establishing the Sunnah here? You or me? Who's establishing the Sunnah? Who are you following? Your nafs? Your hawa? Because this is about constraint. This is about infasturu. What the taqul? If you show patience, then when you're being provoked. When you're being angered. The strong man is not the man who can overthrow anybody, who can wrestle anybody down. The strong man, the Prophet says, the strong man is the one who controls his anger. The one who controls his anger. 
A man came, he said, Ya Rasulullah, awfini, la tabdaw, awfini, la tabdaw, awfini. He kept saying, awfini, give me some real advice. Well, what does that mean? Don't get angry. Right? I'm an Arab. <laughs> Change my personality? Well, no, because this is about elevating yourself above your human nature to a transformed nature. The nature of belief, the nature of taqwa. This is what this deen is about. We have Muslims all over the, the, the Ummah making this deen look like it's a religion of fools. Really. Out of some perceived grievances. From who? To whom? The Prophet, you don't think he was cursed in his lifetime? They wrote poems about him. Those poems are still in our books of literature. Our ulama didn't shy away from writing what they wrote about the Prophet. You can read Ibn Hisham, and you can read the ridicules that these poets, and they were great poets, not these idiots and fools. These were real poets. The Arab, they could write poetry. Ka'ab ibn Zuhair, who made Tawba from his poem. What did the Prophet say? Sahih al-Bukhari, Kitab al munaqib This is in the Sahih. Here's what he says in Mecca to his Sahaba. They're hearing all of these things about the Prophet ﷺ. What does he say? In a riwayah of Ahmed and others, he says, Reflect on this, O servants of Allah. And in a Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari, he says, Aren't you amazed? كيف يصرف الله عني شتم قريش ولعنهم Aren't you amazed how Allah removes whatever the Quraysh have to say about me that's negative? He diverts it from me. Isn't that amazing to you? All of you? Isn't that amazing? He said يشتمون مهمما ويلعنون مهمما وأنا محمد They're talking about this character named Muhammad they're cursing this guy named Muhammad. They intended the Prophet in their poem. Everybody knew who they intended. But how did he look at it? I don't know who they're talking about. That's not me. I'm Muhammad. I'm not Muhammad. I'm not Muhammad. Dante's Muhammad. I'm not Muhammad or however they think they can pronounce that name. That's not the Prophet they're talking about. Don't think they're talking about the Prophet. Nothing that they say can reach the Prophet. The dogs will bark all night at the moon. Do the sounds of the dogs affect the glory of the moon crossing the sky? Do they affect the glory of the moon? We know who our Prophet was. The problem is we haven't told anybody else. We kept this to ourselves. Most of these people are just ignorant people. And there are some very devious, demonic people here. And I'll give you an example about this. There are people that want to see Muslims killing Jews, and there are people that want to see Muslims killing Christians. This is what they want. They want Muslims in Egypt. Where did they air this? They first showed up in Egypt on Egyptian television. Who's doing this and why? What are they trying to get out of this? The internet is filled with slanders about the Prophet's license. It's filled with them. Don't Google it because you'll, you'll vomit, you'll throw up. There's images, there's pictures, there's cartoons, there's comic books, making fun, mocking. This is the reality, but why now? And why this? Really, you think about this. Who's being manipulated here? What does Allah say to Shaitan? We're citizens. Many the minimum. Provoke, instigate, rile up. Those among them, Bani Adam, who you're able to be saltika with your voice, your lies, your deceptions. He's the great deceiver. He's the liar. He loves what's happening now. This shaitan is having a field day. And he's just laughing at the angel. Look at the you chose me over these? Look at these pathetic creatures. You chose me over these? Look at them. Look how easy it is to manipulate them. All I have to do is spread rumors. 
Put something on the internet. And look, they're all behaving like a bunch of fools and idiots. Ah, shaitan is happy as pot. And all these minions. وَأَجْلِبْ عَلَيْهِمْ بِإِخَيْنِكَ وَرَجْنِكَ Bring your cavalry, bring your infantry. You stop minions. Really. People say, oh, you know, this is a big conspiracy. It's a, it is the Iblis. Most of these people don't know they're part of the Iblisic conspiracy. They don't know that. They just hear whispers in their heart. Hmm, I think I'll try that. That's a good idea. Yeah, let's do that. But this is what's going on. This is what Allah is, is telling us. And then what does He say? Get them to do haram things so they get their money. In haram ways, in prohibited ways. Right? And zina, fornication. Get them to have illegitimate children. Because that will destroy them. Destroy their civilization. Destroy their families. Right? home And give them your false promises. And then Allah says, and shaitan only promises them falsehood. But then He says, Right? But you have no authority over my slaves. Why? Because they're people of Sukh. They're people of Taqwa. They're people of Sakina. They're people of Hormel. This is my people. I know what you don't know. And the angel said, Why are you putting somebody who's going to shed blood, kill ambassador? Our Prophet has never killed an ambassador. When Musaylama sent his ambassadors, he sent them back. Kill an ambassador. You know how the Mongols invaded the Muslim countries? Because they were, they were, their ambassadors were killed by an Arabic Muslim ruler. And they sent their hordes. And millions of Muslims lost their lives. Their homes were destroyed. This is what happens. You're playing with fire here. This community is playing with fire. We can have extremists on both sides. We've got extremists here that want to see us killing Christians, and we've got extremists over there that want to see us killing Christians and Jews. This is what they want, because they want a conflagration. You read history. Read history. The Muslims are down. We've been down before. But when we were down in Mecca, we had patience. We had program. We had the teachers there to say, calm down. Mahdan ya Aisha. Calm down, Aisha. This is the way the Prophet conquered the world. He didn't conquer the world with swords and spears. He conquered it with good character. And now we think we can rattle toothless tigers. Really, toothless tigers like Aesop's donkey that finds the, the tiger skin. You know, in Aesop's fables, the donkey finds the tiger skin and he puts it on and he starts going around and all the animals that are run away and they're afraid. But then the fox hears him hee-hawing. He's laughing, but he's hee-hawing. And the fox comes and he says, you know, you better learn how to roar. You're not fooling me. This is what we've become. Like the donkey putting on the, the cloak of a lion. Let's roar. We've been humiliated so long. We humiliated ourselves. Who has humiliated us? Nobody can humiliate you if you have dignity. They only humiliate themselves by denigrating you. These people that are denigrating the Prophet Center, they're denigrating themselves. They're showing what ignorant people they are. These aren't people of any worth or weight. They're empty people, vacuous people. But there's also amongst them demonic people. They want to see Muslims behaving like fools. You know why? Because they spent in the last few years $43 million to produce hate in this country towards the Muslims. $43 trillion million. We don't know what's going on in other places. $43 million. That, that man in Norway who went and killed 69 people, wounded 150 people, blew up a station, all these young people, even some children he killed, he was influenced by these ideas. He wrote 150, 1,500 page texts. 1,583 pages to declare why he did it. You know why he did it? He said, we're turning into Eurasia. The Muslims are taking over, and these, the people that are doing it, are the multiculturalists. The people that want to tell us we can live with Muslims, that they're the same as us, that they share the same values with us. No, my friends, we have to have preemptive strikes now. This is, this is his uh, theology, this is his ideology. 
He was influenced by people in this country writing books. He quoted them. And we'll find, let's go destroy the American embassy. Now, this, this, is, this, is, this is our response. We don't build anymore. We built the greatest buildings in the world. We built the greatest universities in the world. And now you look at the Muslim community seriously. And you have to think about this. Now, in the United States, my warning to all of you, we have a window of opportunity, but I'm really, I'm laying out a warning. We have a window of opportunity in this country to let people know who we are. Because there's other people defining us, and they're using very sophisticated strategies, demonic strategies, to instigate, to provoke, to make Muslims react. You know what Sun Tzu says in the Art of War? He says, anger your enemies. Provoke them so that they fall into disarray. They can't even think. This is what's happened to our community. People can't even think straight. No, patience and taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Asta'inu bi sabri wa salah. Hold to prayer. Hold to prayer. Be. In, 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 in Surah Al-Mutahana, Allah says an amazing thing. He says, رَبَّنَا لَا تَجَعْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Don't make us a, a tribulation for those who disbelieve. فَخْرِ بِنَ الرَّازِ And others say, it means we become such a negative example that people have no encouragement to even think about Islam. They're not interested in finding out. We become a barrier for any interest in Islam. And then he says, immediately after that, وَغْفِرْ لَنَا رَبَّنَا Oh Allah, forgive us. You can, you can destroy us. You're Aziz, you're Hakim, but forgive us. Fakhr ibn al-Razi says, they put asking not to be a tribulation for the disbelievers before asking for forgiveness because if you become a tribulation for those who don't know anything about Islam, you might not get the forgiveness of God. They're more worried about being a tribulation for disbelievers than their forgiveness. That's what he said. Now you look at the ayahs that follow that, they're about relations between people that you have animosity with. Right? Allah can take people who you are fighting now and put between you love. Allah is all powerful. He can make people you don't like now, or you hate now, or they hate you. He can make them your friend. Like the Mongols, they came, they invaded the Muslim land. Within 50 years, people that saw them come as pagans conquering them were praying side by side with them in mosques they built. In 50 years, the great uh, English <coughs> Christian writer Arnold says it's one of the unique cases in history where the conquered conquered their conquerors with Ideas. They came with force, but the Muslims had ideas. We don't even have, we don't have ideas or force now. We're like a mosquito. It's just bothering the, the Western social body. But I'll tell you something. There are people in this country in, in very high positions of power in which nuclear options are not far-fetched for them. I'm, I'm really, I'm telling you this, the absolute truth. There are people in this government, in the military, there are voices there saying, we need to show real force here. This has gotten out of hand. Right? They don't need to send in soldiers. And this country has used nuclear weapons twice, and they've used radiation many times. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Sam Harris, in a best-selling book, argues for a preemptive nuclear strike on the Muslims because they're threatening our existence. And this is crazy stuff, but this is somebody who lectures all over and is held up as an intellectual. So, I, you know, I really, I think Muslims really need to think very deeply about what you're doing here in the United States. You know, if you came here to make some money, it's not going to be that easy to make money for Muslims pretty soon. You know, this, this, I'm, I'm just telling you. You know, my problem is I read too much. You know, people blissful ignorance, that's what they call it. 
But when you see what's happening, when you see what's going on, so, you know, Muslims better really think about this. We, either we practice our religion or we stop pretending that we're Muslims. As far as I'm concerned, I adopted this faith and I'm sick of defending ignorant, backward, reactionary fools. Really, I'm just, I'm tired of it. Brothers, sisters, you know, this is another trying time for Muslims. We're in tribulation, and it's real. And if you don't think it's real, this could affect the election. That's, that's how serious this is. This could affect the election. Killing an ambassador is not a simple thing. We condemn it. First of all, most of us here are American citizens. It's our ambassador. Right? Really. We're here. We might disagree with a lot of foreign policies of this country, but this is our country. And we have a right to protest those policies civilly. We have a right to petition our government. Right? We have a right to elect politicians that aren't going to adhere to policies that we think are misguided. If we're in the minority, they call democracy a tyranny of the majority. Right? It's unfortunate, but that's reality. But tides change. You can turn tides. Organize. Think about changing the scenarios here. There's undeniably a double standard in the West, as far as I'm concerned. This idea somehow that you know, this is freedom of speech. In fact, we had one of the presidential candidates saying, we're defending freedom of speech. We don't have to apologize for our value. Denigrating great leaders, whether you agree with them or not, but denigrating them and mocking them when they're held in the hearts of millions of people to be exalted and high things. That does not advance any values or cause or civilization, no. Because in the end of the day, Muslims are one-fourth of the population on this planet, one-fourth. That's one out of four people. And we have to learn to live together. The Europeans are the historical neighbors of Islam. They're the historical neighbors of Islam. They took the brunt of Asian attacks twice which enabled Europe not to suffer the ignominy of being under that, those hordes. Muslims have had periods of relative peace and other times great difficulty. But in the end of the day, we're neighbors. And we're here in this country. We have to learn how to live together. War is not an option, especially in the light of nuclear power and weapons of mass destruction. This isn't going out with swords at Badr, or Uhud, where a handful of people are killed. In the entire lifetime of the Prophet I sent 23 years of his message, less than a thousand people probably were killed, according to our own historical analysis. That's how many are killed now in one day. We don't want nuclear options on either side. It's a madness. We've got China as well now, really. China is a rising power. It's been a global threat, all this instability. We can't learn to live together as human beings. And this is ultimately what our religions are supposed to be teaching us. And it's about time we started living up to these principles. The, Allah says to the Jews, you're not on anything until you apply your Torah. According to their greatest rabbi, the entire Torah can be reduced to love of God and love of your neighbor. Jew or non-Jew, that's the whole Torah. Jesus Christ said you, you, to his people, you could boil the Ten Commandments down to love of God and, and love of your neighbor. So there's the Old Testament, the New Testament. And our Prophet Prophet said, Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be good to your neighbor. Jibreel used to tell me to, to take care of my neighbor. 
until I thought he was going to have me inherit my neighbor. They would inherit the, the wealth, whatever was left. We have to learn to live as neighbors. I mean, but we all know the story of the Jew who was, used to bang pots and bother him. And then when he got arrested, the Qadi had him arrested for something else. Abu Hanifa didn't hear the pots banging and he went and found out that he was unjust and he got him out of the jail. And he, the Jew said, why'd you do that? He said, because I found out, you're my neighbor, I, I wanted to see what happened to you, and then I found out you were wrongly accused of something, so I made sure that they, uh, justice was restored. What kind of religion is that? Really? We've got demons out there on both sides of the equation. And they're working hard. And if the people who respond to the better angels of their nature, if those people don't rise up, the vast majority of human beings, if they don't rise up and squelch these voices and stop allowing them to dictate the agenda, to write the scenario, to give us the script that we act out, because this we're doing exactly what they want on both sides. Exactly what they want. And it's really time for people in the middle to just say enough is enough. Because these people are like toxic waste. You know, you have nuclear power, it, it's a clean energy, provides lights up houses, but it's got toxic waste. And that, that's the way humans are. We have toxic waste amongst us, really. And they need to be isolated and contained. Really, or, or, or neutralized. <laughs> You know, I wanted to say one thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says about the disbelievers, when, when, when they became zealous and filled with their jahari rage, how did the believers respond? Allah caused this tranquility to enter the hearts of the believers. Right? That's, that's, that's how you respond to this madness. You don't respond to it with more madness. And he caused them to adhere to this teaching of taqwa, of duty. Don't let the hatred of a people cause you to lose your balance. That's what it means. To be justice, to be balanced. Don't let them cause you to lose your equilibrium. Allahumma ja'alna min al-ladheena yistami'una al-qawla wa yattabi'una ahsana. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam kathira. Allahumma antaqam li man nala bi'ilmin min urbihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anta al-muntaqim. Wa lata haq. Wa lana haq. Allahumma antaqim. لمن نالهم من علم يا الله وهدي هؤلاء الجهال الذين لا يعلمون وجعلنا لهم منارة نرشدهم إلى الهدى وإلى النور اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وعلى آله وصحبه وعلى المبشرين بالجنة وأزواجه وذريته ومثيرا بإحسان إلى يوم الدين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعدكم العدل تذكرون واقيموا الصلاة